Okay, uh, thank you very much for being here and thank you to the organizers and the sponsors. This is joint work with uh, Tor and you and at the LSC. So it's about party factions. So let's talk about party factions. Now we have uh, a bunch of quotes on uh, what factions are and uh, they essentially point out the factions are, you know, a structural group within a political party the six control, they have uh, a, share a, com a, a, a sense of common identity and common purpose, they're organized and act as a distinct block, and they are typically based on common ideology and leadership. Now, factions are important, and the other, the other thing that I wanted to say is that the term party is not itself lotsome, the term faction always is, Voltaire. So you can see that these are not my slides because I wouldn't be able to put pictures. So obviously this must be Torrent slides. Now, uh, okay, so factions are important for the function of parties, but we do not seem to know much about them in terms of, uh, you know, formal theory. I mean, there are papers on uh, parties, and for example, Gilad here, there's going to be a literature review later. But I mean, you know, uh, factions we do not understand too well. And this paper, oh, here you have the literature review. Well, before I go to the literature review, uh, this paper is going to be about, you know, an informational theory of factions. So this is going to be a theory of factions that is based on the ability of politicians to share information, to communicate between each other in the party where factions are essentially going to, uh, you know, uh, give authority to politicians that have the ability to gather information better than other politicians. So in a sense, I mean, you know, the faction is going to be the vehicle through which informed, competent politicians make decisions. Now, some literature, there is a recent paper by Persic, Rodriguez, and Silverman, they look at factions, they have a much bleaker view of factions than we are, than we have, I mean, it's about, you know, uh, pork and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, like giving benefits to strongholds. There, is, there are papers that take factions as given. There is the, the work by Thorin here on leadership, and, uh, well, I mean, there is some work on parties. I mean, you know, there are other papers, including the paper by Gilat that I mentioned before. Now, the basis for the uh, information aggregation communication structure that we will uh, use in this paper are in um, some earlier papers with some with Torren and, I mean, with Andrea Galeotti and Christian Ghiglino. So let me tell you the model in brief. Actually, before I tell you the model, let me tell you a story about the model. I mean, the story that I have about the model is, uh, you know, suppose we are a party, and uh, each one of us comes with uh, some, you know, essentially some voting power or some, you know, some power to have part of the platform for the next elections being written according to our wishes. And then there are consultations. And in these consultations, we can delegate to each other, uh, you know, the right to include our ideals, our ideas, in the, in the platform of the party for the next elections. Now, through this process of delegation of authority, factions form. And after factions are formed, the leaders of the factions or those who have authority, decision-making power, they gather as much information as possible possibly within the whole party or possibly only within the faction, and this determines how informed their decision will be. So this is essentially the story that we are trying to model. Is first the and then uh, we are much less ambitious than you're implying. No, we, the party is exogenous. Yeah, I mean, you know, the idea, I mean, this alternative, this could also be a theory of party formation, but I mean, we, we will seek, you know, uh, equilibria that maximize utilitarian welfare, and so, I mean, we think of, you know, people that have a common ideals and they form factions within this framework rather than, you know, groups. 
So let me tell you what the model is like. I mean, it's, it's uh, so we have a set of politicians. There is, th yeah, there is go only going to be one party indeed. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, pa the factions are going to be endogenous. Yeah. And there is a set of policies, K. So imagine the different policies that compose a platform for elections, like defense, environment, health, uh, you know, I mean, uh, devolution, so on and so forth. And there is a given endowment of policy-making policy authority. Say, for example, uh, you know, Enriqueta is the leader in devolution, I'm the leader on environment, David is the leader on defense, so on and so forth. And uh, factions form by a voluntary delegation of authority. And uh, we assume the delegation is repeated, so it can take many rounds. But, you know, until, uh, you, know, uh, it, 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 you know, there is no scope for further delegation. Now, uh, the final assignment of policy-making authority is given by A. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's another assignment. Okay, after this round, after this round of delegation, then politician receive signals, so receive information. So we, th we think of factions as, you know, fairly stable, uh, you know, groupings in parties that are not contingent on the information that is revealed. I mean, one could think of an alternative theory, but some of the results that we will put forward do depend on the fact that factions are decided ex ante. So you, I will see you an important result that depends on that. Now, politicians receive a, a binary signal. Sorry, how do I... Well, anyway, binary signal on uh, uh, a uniformly distributed state of the world. And uh, uh, the strat there in, then there is strategic communication between politicians. So each politician I sends a message, MIJ, binary message to every other politician J. So without loss of generality, there are two pure strategies here. There is the fully revealing one and there is the babbling one. It's uh, fairly simple. And uh, then there is platform design by a finally policy choices. For each policy K, the politician AK decides YK. Okay? So it's a fairly simple. Oh, so one, one thing, uh, Francisco, you have false information. Sorry? I don't understand. I receive a signal 0 1 about the state that is uniform. Information that I have yeah, yeah, exactly. They're not perfectly informed. I mean, there is a real scope for information aggregation. So it's not a situation where some agents know perfectly <coughs> the state of the world and others uh, are, are uninformed. They all have some information. And these are the payoffs. I mean, everybody would like every policy to be as close as possible to a bliss point, which is decomposed into the state of the world theta, so there is a common state, and uh, her own ideology. So this is, a, you know, this is a representation that we have also in other papers. I mean, the idea is that, so the common state of the world theta, for example, represents a common state on, uh, let's say, the, the, the economy. So if the economy is booming, then all components of policy should uh, work accordingly. So, for example, immigration policy can be relaxed, uh, you know, uh, defense budget can be expanded, so on and so forth. Now, if the economy is in a recession, you know, you have to tighten the belly on all sorts of uh, dimensions of, uh, of policy. But then you have uh, individual ideology of the politician. So I'm more leftist, let's say, than Andrea. I don't know if this is true. I mean, I, usually it works because I'm fairly leftist. Usually these examples work. And so I would like that all the decisions are made closer to my ideology than to Andrea's ideology. Okay. Now, l'equilibrium is going to be in pure strategy, perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Please don't ask about mixed strategies. Uh, punishment. Okay, there is an important caveat on how we construct the equilibrium. So, the, you know, there are different parts to the problem. In the first stage, we delegate authority, and in the second stage, we communicate. Now, uh, the reason why I want to delegate authority, let's say, to Enriqueta is because in, a, in the subsequent stage, Enriqueta will be more informed than I am. So this is really the crucial, you know, point of the paper. I mean, you know, delegation of authority because of information. The, 
this trade-off between power and information. And uh, uh, now, one way, the, the best way to enforce, you know, the, the, you know, the way to enforce the optimal equilibrium would be to say that if, you know, let's say that we have to delegate authority according to a specific network structure, if any of us uh, the one that maximizes utilitarian welfare. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, if suppose that I fail, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I it's a, so I, if I fail, if any of us fails to delegate authority to the person that she's intended to delegate to in equilibrium, that the worst possible punishment would be complete communication shutdown. Right? Everybody starts to bubble to everybody. Now this will ensure, you know, this is the worst possible punishment for failing to delegate authority in the optimal way. Now we believe that this is not too realistic. I mean, it, decrees, it, it, it requires a degree of coordination within the party that we don't find, uh, you know, I mean, you know, it could be an alternative assumption, but we prefer to assume that the worst punishment that I can uh, be subject to if I fail to delegate my authority to Enriqueta as I should in, in the uh, hypothetical equilibrium is that everybody starts to bubble only to me. So I become uninformed. I, I, you know, in equilibrium I'm uninformed if I delegate to Enriqueta and off the equilibrium if I fail to delegate I remain uninformed. That's, that's the way we construct the equilibrium. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm using the wrong. Okay, the first part of the result, this is really a lemma that follows from uh, earlier paper, and it's the solution of, uh, I mean, this game is built in blocks. I mean, you have delegation, then you have communication and decision. So communication and decision, this is also reminiscent of some work by David. I mean, we have uh, this, const you know, we, we have this generalized construction in uh, Galeotti, Guillino, and Squintani that basically solves the problem of uh, uh, this multiplayer communication and uh, the decision is just the expected value of theta given the information held in equilibrium plus the bias. And uh, a, mm, a politician is truthful to another politician if and only if the bias difference between the two politicians is smaller than this quantity here, which is a quantity that is inversely related on the information of the receiver, the decision maker in equilibrium. The idea being that, you know, if Enriqueta is very well informed, it's going to be more difficult for me to, com you know, to communicate truthfully to her in equilibrium, right? Because she already has a lot of information. So this is something that comes out of the representation. And this is just the formula for the expected utility. It's a mean invariance decomposition. This is the residual variance. And this is the ideological loss. Okay? Now, uh, politicians delegate authority until no further delegation can take place. Now, in principle, complicated factional networks could arise. Nevertheless, so, okay, so we define a factional network as a directed weighted graph that essentially tells you, starting from the initial endowment of authority, who is going to make decisions. And, uh, and, you know, and there is a quote that I, I mean, Toran is much better than me at interpreting the relationship between what we do and, and the real world, so I, I will skip this. Uh, so in principle, complicated factional networks can arise, and in equilibrium only disjoint, but in equilibrium we find that we, there are only disjoint networks with uh, uh, the unique leaders. So these are the, this is the structure of delegation that you would expect, right? Just the, the, the delegation part of the game, how does it work? Right, so I mean, there are several stages, right? I mean, you know, there are, uh, you know, as many stages as you need. And then in the, you know, until no, nobody further delegates authority, then the game ends. And uh, that's, that's literally how it works. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter the order in which I ask player to delegate authority. I mean, it, it. There's only one round of symptoms, right? There. And there is only, uh, yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah, this is a technical, uh, com it's a technical limitation. I mean, there is only one round of communication because, uh, and, uh, I mean, dealing with more than one round of communication, this paper is, is not easy, as well, David knows. I mean, you have work on that. And... Uh, uh, yeah, that's for future research. Yeah. 
Ok, in any equilibrium, uh, the party is divided in a collection of disjoint factions, and for all factions, all politicians delegate all decisions to a unique leader who does not delegate the decision further. Now, exposed, this result is fairly intuitive. I mean, the only thing I'm saying is that if I were to delegate Enriqueta, but I knew that Enriqueta was going to further delegate to Andrea, there are two possibilities. Either I'm willing to delegate authority to Andrea in the first place, or I'm not, in which case I wouldn't delegate to Enriqueta to start with. It's deceivingly simple. I mean, it's in build where, where it's, you know, we're building in the assumption that delegation occurs before information. If delegation occurred after information, then things would be more complicated because delegation would be signal dependent. And so you may have much more complex structures that arise. Okay. But we care about this decision. We care about this decision because, I mean, this is what we observe in the real world. Infections have a unique leader and they're disjoint. Now, uh, okay, the key point of the paper, as I said, is this trade-off between power and information. I delegate to somebody only if they're more informed than I am. So let's see, let me skip the example because I want to go to something else. Let me tell you precisely how it works. Uh, well, I mean, we have to define for every faction leader, define the maximum information held by the leader in equilibrium. This is essentially the number of players communicating truthfully to her plus herself, because she also has a signal. And for all the other players, you know, let's take them as completely uninformed. Well, then, you know, intuitively, uh, you know, each player will delegate to the leader, if and only if, by doing so, she has an expected utility that is higher than by delegating to anybody else. So that solves the problem. And a consequence of this is a fairly intuitive property, <coughs> which is that the factions are ideologically connected. So I delegate only to people that are close to me in ideology. There are no gaps in the factions. So, and this is, is nice because we recover definitions and stylized facts. So the stuff that I started with, uh, an inter-party combination, clique, grouping whose members share a common sense, a sense of common identity and common purpose, and are organized to act collectively as a distinct block within the party to achieve their goals. So, for example, you know, in a post-war labor party, we have the Bevanites and the Gaskellites. Now, as I recall, Bevan was the left part of the party, whereas Gaskell was the uh, moderate. And, uh, well, I mean, they were leaders of different factions. Things become a little bit more complicated when we think of the Italy in the Italian Christian democracy. You know, it's not clear that ideology was playing such a huge role, but uh, anyway. Okay, now, I mean, I don't know how much time I'm left. Uh, there is no information in Italy. <laughs> now, but I mean, there is a sense in the literature or in also in, in common sense that, you know, I mean, aggregating information is one of the functions of parties. So you would like to have a theory of factions whereby those who are better at aggregating information wind up being in power. And this is really part of our story. You know, I mean, I delegate to people that are more informed than I am. So this is... How much time do I have? 20. 20? Oh, great. Okay, let me give you a few examples. Then I'm going to talk about welfare and then I will conclude. Um, so the first example is... Uh, is uh, um, I mean, it's really a game theoretical example. I mean, it's not sup supposed to represent anything too realistic. But I mean, I think it's nice because it is uh, for the properties that it will, uh, they will, will highlight. So suppose that there is an odd number of politicians and uh, that they, each one of them comes endowed with a policy decision to make. And uh, suppose that the ideological distance between neighboring politician beta is <coughs> the same, is beta. And the second example is going to be slightly less, I mean, I think it's less nice in a game theoretical sense, but maybe more realistic. 
There are three ideological groups, left, center, and right, and uh, they all have the same ideology within the group, but they differ ideologically across groups. Um, okay. So let me start with an example with the equidistant bias model, but model, I mean, game. So there is a non number of politicians, if there are seven, each one comes and down with a decision and uh, they are a distance beta from each other, ideologically. Now, uh, the first case is, you know, the, you know the, the first case is the case in which beta is small, especially, essentially beta has to be smaller than the smallest between one tenth and one over 45 square root of five. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> In this case, the party is unified under the, most mod under the more moderate leader. Why is that? Well, because the more, moderate, you know, the more moderate politician, politician number four, is able to gather at least, uh, three, uh, you know, at least uh, three signals, uh, sorry, two signals plus their own. And under that condition, even the most extreme politicians, so that is politicians one and seven, prefer to delegate to the most moderate politician rather than standing alone and uh, uh, making a decision uh, uh, with full information. Right? So it is, feasible, it is feasible to have an equilibrium in which they delegate to the, uh, to the, to the most moderate politician. No, sorry, not with full information, with no information. I take this back. Yeah. Would they, if, the, the, if, if they stand on, on their own with full information, then they always prefer to keep authority. So they prefer to delegate to the most moderate politician than by making a decision standing on their own, and everybody stops talking to them. So it is possible to have an equilibrium in which there is delegation from the most moderate politician. And this is clearly the best thing that can happen to the party in this example. <coughs> because, I mean, this way the party will have, you know, moderate po policies, you know, you have quadratic loss, so moderate policies are a good thing. And uh, uh, at the same time, the, the central guy is as informed as anybody else in equilibrium, so he is as competent as anybody else, and that's good. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly, yeah. that's intuition. Please. Please, I'm just motivated by a question that, uh, conversation that I have here. So, your okay. idea of this theory is about information. Okay? But in fact, the leader of the faction is, is the one that manages to get more people to get in the Yeah. So, in reality, it's more a theory based on trust or affinity than information. So, the fact that I can collect more information because yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that, uh, yes, but I mean, I agree, I mean, the, the aspect of delegation is important, but it's delegation to the most informed person, so, or at least the person who in principle would be most informed. And, I mean, you know, keep in mind that affinity here plays two roles. I mean, first of all, it makes me willing to delegate to Enriqueta, but it also makes me willing to talk to Enriqueta, right? I mean, if, I'm, if we're very ideologically distant, then I wouldn't be able to be truthful to Enriqueta. So it's the two things go, go hand in hand. Yeah, but, but the, the fact that Enriqueta is a fact of a lot of people might serve the leader, not the fact that she has more information. Well, yeah. but uh, the because reason why she has more the information, the reason that she, why she has, well, you know, it's true, the primitives, the primitives are not information here. The primitives are ideologies. So it's exactly right that, and, and this is, I think, it's important. I mean, it's not just about moderation, so where I stand in the ideological spectrum, but it's also about how many people I have close by in terms of uh, ideological neighbors. And Enriqueta has many friends because she, you know, because she has many friends, she becomes a very good leader because she will have a lot, because she will be very competent. She has many people talking to her. So in a way, you, are, you know, you, the usual reason why, you know, being a faction leader is somebody who has many friends is a little is turned on its head, right? Because usually you are thinking about, well, if I have many friends, I can impose my will on the party. But here it's it's a normative theory, if you in a sense. I mean, you know, if you wish. I mean, you know, I, it's good that I become a faction leader because I have a lot of information. So, 
So information is important. I mean, think about it in another... Let me, let me tell you dif in a different way. If there were no information here, there would be no reason to delegate authority. Right? If we all had the same information, no delegation. So in that sense, information is crucial. Well, that's a big question. I mean, there's a strategic coordination. No, but here, it, the delegation is voluntary. So I just care about my own payoff. Uh, you know, I don't care. I don't have uh, altruistic motives for the party. No, no, I still care about my own payoff. I'm not in the majority. If my party takes it... There would be a different model, David. Well, yeah, it's a different model. There's still a motivation. No, no, I, that, no, that would be a factual motivation based on the same primitive but without information. Now, okay. In this model, in, I mean, the way we rig the model, the only reason in which I for which I would delegate to Enriqueta is because she makes my utility higher. But, I mean, you know, there are other papers, I mean, also Gilad's paper is one of them, but, you know, essentially, you know, you form a faction or a party because, you, you know, you, you commit, you know, I mean, a good, John, John's paper is also about that. I mean, you commit to either pull together resources or to make joint decisions, and by doing that, you know, you increase your... These are, you know, different theories. I mean, this is a theory based on information. But, but, but again, let me mention some value between them. They no, will never me, share information. Let me, let me, I have no information whatsoever and they want to relate to me. If, even if I'm not going to receive any signals because I'm going to be able to put their signals. So, so the fact... That's, that's true, true that. but... Okay, but let me move on. I mean, I, I, we, 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 we should talk about this aside. Okay, so now let me say that the beta is a little bit larger, so we're a little bit further apart. So now it's impossible for, for, for the most extreme uh, politicians to delegate to the moderate guy. They will not, this is not part of an equilibrium. So the question is, okay, now there are different possibilities. So for example, um, there are different possibilities. There are seven politicians. It could be that Politician one is willing, you know, politician one is, let's say, willing to, can, to delegate to three. By the same token, two is willing to delegate to four. And, uh, you know, six is willing to delegate to four. Seven is willing to delegate to five. So, I mean, in principle, there is different possibilities in which to partition the party. But it turns out that the optimal way to partition the party is one in which the moderate guy is a singleton. So he leads his own faction and uh, nobody delegates to her. So why is that? Essentially the big, you know, we have this quadratic loss, so we have risk aversion, concavity. The big issue for the party, you know, when you're looking for the equilibrium that maximizes the social wealth, the weighted utilitarian wealth, the, the utilitarian welfare, is to make sure that you tie in uh, the extremists. Extremist, you know, leaving the extremist alone is the worst thing that you can do because these people are going to take very, you know, extreme positions. This is going to hurt a lot everybody. Now, the best way, you know, so what you want to do, you want to make sure that the extremists delegate as far to the center as possible. So the player one will delegate to three and player seven will delegate to five. However, because the, 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 the factions are part, you know, are, are part, you know, the faction system is a partition of the party, this means the five cannot further delegate to four. And this makes it so <coughs> that four has to run, you know, has to be on his own. So you focus on the, the cradle dominant movement. Yeah, no, there's plenty of equilibrium. Is, is there any reason to do that? I mean, the, yeah, the that's process a, we generate this now? Well, I mean, that's the, reason, that's the reason why we think that this is better as a theory of factions than as a theory of parties, right? I mean, so, I mean, within a party, we share a common goal. So, I mean, it is more reasonable to think that we will be able to, you know, to coordinate on the, you know, uh, utilitarian uh, top equilibrium. And uh, that's, that's the only thing I can say in my defense. I mean, the other thing that I should say in my defense is that in this literature focusing on Focusing on uh, either top Pareto or uh, utilitarian top equilibria is a standard assumption. It's a com these are communication games. So. But uh, that's, that's all that I can say. Well, there more communication because there are also... The yeah, there is also that part, yeah. 
Okay, but if you take the standpoint of how to organize factions in a feasible way, but in a way that maximizes the utility of the party as the sum of the politicians, what you want to do is to make sure that you tie in the extremists. So the extreme... No, I, I understand yeah. So, okay, then uh, for a slightly larger bias, what you get is that, well, now one is not willing to delegate to three, she's only willing to delegate to two, so the, the faction system is going to be one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, right? I mean, that's uh, what you get. And uh, finally, if the bias, sorry, if the bias is too large, then uh, what you get is that, well, the party is completely... Uh, broken. I mean, it's, 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 it's not factionalized. Okay. Now, let me turn, uh, uh, let me just point out that this example leads to the characterization. I mean, essentially what you want to do, I mean, you calculate for any uh, distance beta, the, uh, the, 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 the distance the ideolo between ideological neighbors, you calculate how far, you know, towards the, the, the mod, you know, how far politicians are willing to delegate. So for in the second case, they were willing to delegate, uh, you know, from one to three. In the third case, from one to two. And uh, this gives you a way to build the, the you know, to, to find the optimal equilibrium in a recursive faction. So you start from the extremists, you make them delegate as far as they can. That's the first faction. Then you get the other people delegate as far as they can. That's another faction. If you wish to see it, this is the characterization. I mean, there is nothing there more than what I just said, so I will go fast. Um, now, we have, um, we believe, I mean, I, I, I think we have to, something to say about the Kribe's critique here, because, uh, well, I mean, you cannot infer platform of the party directly from preferences. Uh, nor from a summary statistical preferences, you have to understand how factions are formed. This is part of the, you know, part of what we are saying. Now, I mean, this is not the only theory that would deliver this prediction, but I mean, I think it's important to have this prediction. Now, cluster party. In the cluster party, I mean, uh, we make, a, the only thing that I want to point out, we make the assumption that there are at least uh, three politicians in each one of the clusters. So there are three ideological groups, left, center, and right. Within the group, the, everybody has the same ideology. So the, the, the leftist people have the ideology minus BL. The centrist people have the ideology zero. And the right-wing people have the ideology R. So, okay, I mean, you know, there is some work to do. But let me just tell you what, okay, this is the party welfare by assigning any action K to a leader of group J. It's fairly intuitive, actually. But let me just tell you what the results are. Also because I don't know about time, so. I'm fine. Five, okay. Okay, so basically the, the thing that I wanted to say is that if you have small biases or large groups, then the party is unified <coughs> under a dominant faction. In the opposite case in which you have large biases or small groups, then the party is completely broken apart, three different clusters. And then you have the intermediate case when you have you know, a faction of the center left or possibly left by the left or the center and the other case the center right of course. Um, now, um, the only thing that is important here I think is the role played by the, the size of the groups. So it is intuitive that if you have small biases then you will have a unified party. Here, you know, there is some role also played by the size of the groups. I mean, if you have large groups then you have a tendency of unifying the party. And this is the reason is because you, you may have a leader that is so well informed that people are more willing to delegate to her. So that's essentially, the, again, the key point of information here. You know, information has a tendency to aggregate in this model. Okay, so finally welfare, yeah? So, so the side's effect, you're just saying that basically this guy is gonna get a lot of secrets. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, alternatively, we could just, you know, skip, you know, skip through, not talk about the size, just talk about the information. So if you have, I mean, essentially what we are saying is that if you have a very competent politician, this politician will be able to unify the party, although there is ideological differentiation. But if all possible leaders are not that competent, then you're more likely to have factions. 
which you know I think it's it's a sensible thing to say. So, okay. Okay. Welfare analysis. Uh, okay. I'm not going to read the quote, but I just want to say that there are two ways to think about welfare in this model. One of them is to compare the equilibrium with uh, a centralized party where decisions are either, you know, are, are centralized possibly to a moderate leader. The other benchmark, which in a way seems to us is what people had in mind in the literature, you know, for, for a long time, is between factionalized and a non-factionalized party where decisions are shared uh, between faction leaders or in a sense politicians exercise their own judgment. Right, I mean, you know, we started with this Voltaire's quote, the factions are always bad. But let's see. Now, factions are bad if you compare them with the centralized party. Right, I mean, in this model, if you, if you manage to unify the party under a competent leader, this is better. Now, the intu I'm, I mean, I could give you the intuition, but I mean, if for reasons of time, I will skip it. But... Uh, Relative to the case of a non-factionalized party, where every politician exercises its own judgment, well, then it's better to have factions. Right? And this is always true in the equidistant bias case. So this is a little bit of a provocation, right? I mean, we like to think that politicians should exercise their own judgment and the factions are bad. Well, but if factions really put the people who are more competent and more moderate in the position of making the calls. I mean, then factions will be good, right? I mean, it's better to aggregate rather than to disaggregate. And uh, nevertheless, I mean, you know, for, for game theoretically, there is something interesting here in the sense that although this is always true that factions are better than non-factionalized parties, this is always true with the equidistant biases. We can find the counterexample in the case of the three clusters. Essentially, the story is something like this. Imagine that you have a center-left coalition led by the left, and then you have a bunch of people to the right, you know, a bunch of people in the right cluster, and this right cluster is very extreme. Now, they suffer so much, the parties, you know, they are part of the party. They suffer so much from the leadership to the left that you may be better off if part of the leadership was shifted to the center. So in that sense, you know, a non-factionalized party does better than a factionalized one. Okay, I think I should... Ah, no, there's something very, very quickly that I wanted to say. Uh, so far we have allowed the leader, the faction leader, to gather information from anybody in the party. I mean, this is an open, we call an open system, communication system. You can think of you know, societies in which if, I'm, if I belong to a faction, I can only talk to the people in my faction. If I found talking to people in another faction, I'm, something very bad happens to me. Now, what is the consequence of that? Well, nothing in the case of the cluster parties, although this is because we assume that each cluster has at least three politicians. I, I can give you the details if you wish. Now, in the case of the uh, equidistant bias case, something strange happens. Now, you remember the example with intermediate bias, I had the moderate guy being on his own, and this is under open communication. Under colleagues communication, he cannot be on his own. The intuition is fairly, I mean, it's fairly intuitive exposed, right? If, if I keep the most moderate guy on his own, then he's going to have very poor information, right? I mean, under closed communication, he doesn't have good information, so I'm better off attaching him to one of the other factions, although he's not going to make a decision. And he's not going to make a he's not going to be the guy making a decision because one wouldn't delegate to four, one can only delegate to three. So here I have the counterintuitive result that the most moderate guy has to delegate to somebody who is slightly less moderate in order to achieve first best. But this is all entirely due to the structure of communication, the fact that you can talk only within the faction. Okay, I think I should conclude. Uh, so we talked about factions within parties. I mean, this was about a theory that is based on information and communication. Now, uh, the model is constructed in such a way that it recovers descriptive and stylized facts, which is good. 
we have something to say with respect to the Kriber critique and uh, provocatively welfare effects are ambiguous so having all the politicians exercising their own judgment may be the worst thing that can happen in a party okay thank you very much I think it would be interesting to apply your model to coalitions too, because you essentially think of one party, but it's much more difficult because the coalitions in the majority usually determines the leader, but of course the best way to be efficient one. Yeah, I mean, you know, alternatively, you know, I, I would just be happy if we could, uh, you know, take uh, the paper to the next step and look at elections. I mean, already that would be something that uh, would make me happy. Now, I mean, the thing is that here, you know, so you have this idea of platforms. Right, I mean, you, you basically, you know, the way that we constructed the model is one in which, you know, if you're a politician, you make a decision just based on what you like to receive as a bliss point without any external constraints. Now, the external constraints induced by an election or by a coalition formation with other parties you know, will have, of course, will have an effect on the, on the, on the, the result, but um, it's not something we did. Okay, thank you.